Medical Sense podcast with me, Dr. Kirstine McKenzie. Today, I'm going to give you a brief overview of France at the start of Louis XIV's reign. The country we know today as France was shaped considerably during the French Revolution in 1789. The author L.P. Hartley once declared that the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. And this can be applied to pre-revolutionary France, known in French as the Ancien Régime or Old Régime in English. However, before I give you an overview of French society during the early modern period and particularly during the reign of Louis XIV, I would like to briefly discuss the geography and culture of early modern France. If you looked at the map of France at the beginning of Louis XIV's reign, around 1643, the first thing that you would notice is that it is not quite the hexagon shape that we are all familiar with today. If you look at eastern France, for example, at this time, the border comes in at the side. During this time, Alsace, which is now part of modern France, was, at the start of Louis XIV's reign, part of the Holy Roman Empire. The Duchy of Lorraine, which is now part of modern France, was a semi-autonomous region in the east. Other autonomous or semi-autonomous regions included Franche Comité to the east and the Duchy of Savoy in the southeast. These territories were all outside France's official provincial borders, which stopped at Provence, Burgundy and Champagne. France's southern border in 1643 halted at Nevers, Foy and Languedoc. The current border we are all familiar with is further south and now includes the historic province of Roussillon, which is in fact part of French-speaking Catalonia, which until the Treaty of the Pyrenees in 1659 between France and Spain resulted in the French-speaking parts of Catalonia being brought into the French state. We will discuss this in greater depth in a future podcast. The northern border of France in 1643 would have been unfamiliar to modern eyes too. Again, the borders fall slightly shorter than what we would be familiar with today. The northern border of France stopped at Picardy and Artois. The cities of Lille and Dunkirk became French later in the 17th century. Another feature that would strike modern observers as unusual is that the town of Avignon still belonged to the papal see of Rome. Although France was one of the oldest political kingdoms in Europe, it was clear that it needed to secure its borders. Today, France is a very centralised state compared to France under the old regime. The current French state is divided into département, communes and arrondissements, and all are overseen and governed by national institutions in Paris. The current French government is very much a product of the French Revolution in 1789. Old regime France was divided into provinces, each with their own regional capitals and some with their own parliaments or estates, which gathered together the local ruling classes to discuss the issues of the day. Historian Ian Williams has called old regime France a federation of provinces. Even across the French state, King Louis XIV had different titles. In Provence, he was Comte de Provence, whereas in Dauphin, Louis XIV held the title Dauphin de Venois. Each province had its own traditions, laws and customs. Some provinces, such as Artois, Burgundy and Languedoc, had their own estates. There were two kinds of representative assemblies in the provinces. The Pays d'Election, which did not have the power to raise taxes, and the Pays d'État, which did have the power to raise taxes. The Pays d'État could be tough opponents of the king's policies. They saw it as their duty to protect local privileges against an encroaching French king. The Pays d'Election concerned Louis XIV far less as he could raise taxes in these areas without consulting the regional assemblies. The French legal system was not uniform and did not reflect the current legal system in France, which again is a product of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic codification of the law. <laughs> 
France under the old regime was a patchwork of different legal systems, reflective of the varying histories of the areas concerned. In the south of France, the courts used Roman law, and in the north, the courts used customary law, where it could vary from village to village. Furthermore, in some regions, there were parlements, which is not to be confused with the meetings for political debate, that were instead sovereign courts, and in the beginning of Louis XIV's reign, royal edicts held no significance. But during the course of his reign, Louis XIV strengthened the crown's oversight of these courts. These courts could act as the final courts of appeal, obstructive to the wishes of the crown. Furthermore, customs and taxes were not uniform across the country. Some cities and towns had their own taxes levied against goods from other parts of France, yet allowed free trade with other countries. There were also national structures directed by the crown which aimed to provide unifying links across provinces, including the king's ability to raise a military force to defend France and its authority rested firmly with the crown which united the nation. The organisation and evolution of such an army was a major achievement of Louis XIV's reign. And at the beginning of his reign, Louis XIV was very much dependent on the regional nobles to assist recruitment. Furthermore, military contracts at this time were entirely voluntary, and as Louis XIV's reign progressed, the French army became a professional military force. There were also offices, a nationwide network of courts which were overseen by the main court in Paris. This system of courts sat above the local courts in the regions and concerned itself with the tal, the primary direct tax extracted by the crown. At the beginning of Louis XIV's reign, these offices were for sale, and the prestigious posts often went to the highest bidder. During his reign, Louis XIV sought to curtail this practice. In the army, he would often promote experience and ability, in addition to promoting persons of noble lineage. The commissars inspected and regulated appointments within the French state. Before the French Revolution in 1789, French society was structured into three estates, or three social classes, with the king at the top of the social hierarchy. The king was the divinely anointed head of the kingdom of France and its people. In this society, everyone had their divinely ordained place, and this was deeply understood. Anyone who dared step out of place was severely reprimanded. Below the monarchy, there was the first estate, the clergy, the second estate, the nobility, and by far the most numerous, the third estate, which comprised everyone else. The third estate comprised of the wealthy bourgeoisie to urban dwellers, such as shopkeepers and publicans, to the dirt poor and rural peasantry. Let's look at each estate in greater depth. The first estate was the clergy, and the French church was devoutly Catholic. The king had taken an oath at his coronation to uphold the Catholic religion in France, which explains Louis XIV's attitude towards the Huguenots, who, as Protestants, were considered as outsiders within the French state. The French Catholic Church was also subject to edicts from Rome and was governed by canon law. The Assembly of French Clergy, which consisted of bishops drawn from across France, met to discuss ecclesiastical matters every five years. The top posts within the French Catholic Church went to aristocrats and the middling to lower posts went to the middle or bourgeoisie class. Their role was to administer the sacraments, hear confession and perform mass for all the king's subjects and ensure their spiritual welfare. The church also distributed poor relief and looked after the sick and dying in their final days. Looking at the second estate, the nobility... The nobility was divided between the noblesse de robe, the nobility of the robe, members of the nobility who were government administrators, and the nobles of the sword, nobles in military service and are those who had held ancient titles. Estimates for these vary between 120,000 to 350,000 throughout France. Noblemen occupied many top positions in both church and state as archbishops, provincial governors, military generals, and ambassadors for France. They could also collect taxes from the third estate, but wealth amongst the ancient nobility varied. Some were extremely wealthy and owned large chateaux, and others were destitute and poor. 
Under Louis XIV, numbers of nobility of the robe increased, creating resentment and jealousy amongst the nobility of the sword. Louis XIV recognised the need for excellent administrators who were very loyal and who would collect taxes, thereby enabling him to increase the size of the army and create the magnificence of Versailles. Many of the nobles of the robe were wealthy bourgeoisie who could pay for their offices and who were appointed with the approval of the crown. In short, it was a nobility that Louis XIV could control. After the Fronde, which was in part a revolt of the nobility of the sword, Louis XIV felt he could trust the nobility of the robe far better. The third estate comprised of everyone else in French society, from wealthy middle-class industrialists, entrepreneurs and bankers, to traders and merchants who dealt with goods in the cities, to rural peasants, the destitute and the poor. However, very few businessmen made great profits. Such was the extent of taxes and regulations around trade and commerce. Urban dwellers, who were still very much a small percentage of the overall population of France, lived in squalor beset by poor hygiene and crime. Rural farming communities were often poor, living from hand to mouth. Yet these communities came together in times of need and looked after their own. Peasants were bound to give the nobility taxes as part of their rights to work the land. Some peasants leased their land and buildings, such as mills and storehouses, which could be used by peasants for a fee payable to the noble landlord. These fees were enforced through the seigneurial court, which settled legal disputes between the peasants and their noble landlords. Within the rural peasantry, there were different degrees of prosperity based on the amount of land, the equipment that they had, and their position in village life. Aspects of these groups, the clergy, the nobility, and the French people will be explored in greater depth in future podcasts. As Meldrum travels through rural France, he eats and stays in inns or auberges. Indeed, throughout the novel, there is a recurrence of inns as a meeting place for the characters. Later in the novel, John Hamilton stays in an inn in Madrid, and in another chapter, travels to London where he meets the Scottish Highlander Alastair MacDonald at an inn in Southwark. Finally, Robert Meldrum's first encounter with John Hamilton takes place in an auberge in Marley on the outskirts of Paris. But what was it like to be a visitor to an inn in France in the 1670s? What sights and smells would have greeted you? It is clear that Meldrum finds some of the behaviour within the inn morally reprehensible, and as a reader we cannot be sure whether it is due to Meldrum's religious nature or his youthful naivety, or as Molyneux indicates, there are some cultural differences between Britain and France. Meldrum is suffering from what modern observers would call culture shock. Public houses were important meeting places within their respective communities and could be visited by a vast array of people, including travellers on foot, horsemen, traders, military men, ambassadors, farmers, women, the young, the old and the infirm. All visitors were welcome and the inn was the centre of most rural communities. Inns were places of overnight accommodation, a place to dine, and a place for the poor to be able to afford beer at cheaper rates. Although the authorities frowned upon female presence within the taverns, women could be found in these establishments as landladies or servants. They could also be found as wives of travellers accompanying their husbands, or single women or married women involved in prostitution, and some young women visited the tavern to look for a potential partner. We are made aware of this, in the Guardia Cossets, when Meldrum is sat in an inn with Peter and a lady, uninvited, sits on his lap. Meldrum is horrified. We either conclude from this that she was a prostitute, as Meldrum states, or she could simply be a lady looking for love. 
The sound effects are provided by the following. Kev P888 FR Traditional Music at Freesound. Kev P888 1649 FR Village at Freesound. Herbert Boland Cafe underscore Paris at Freesound. The theme tune is provided by Ionix Music. This podcast is the copyright of History Gateway Limited, UK.